Thank you very much. It's a great honor to uh, be in this institution. And of course, a little frustrating because I cannot see you, all of you, straight in the eyes because of this light that is coming this way. But morally, I'm out there. It's a great privilege, a great honor to be with all of you, decision makers, people who could and need to and will spread the word. We are in a unique institution on the planet that today can share and disperse the information and the solutions that we as a species are facing up today. Seven billion people who are taking more from the ocean than the ocean can produce. Seven billion people who are, together with every one of us, heading toward bankruptcy. We, thanks to this institution, can stop that from happening. We can produce food in a sustainable way. We can produce energy in a sustainable way. And we can produce certain products, medical products amongst other things, which are taking care of the problems that we have to face up every day on the planet. For me, unlike many other places where I have the privilege of going and speaking, it is a privilege to feel that I have a mission. And my mission is to share what this institution is doing unique on the planet and can help our species as we add another 100 million people to the planet and as we are heading toward 9 billion people in 2050. That's very heavy responsibilities on every one of you. But there's nobody else out there who can pick up that mission and put it out there and share it out there with people who are in great needs. Let's not forget that we're living what I call the communication revolution. The fact that every human being on the planet is connected with each other. Even the poor people, as I've seen in India, sitting behind a computer, a hundred people asking questions, not about India, but about everywhere else on the planet. This is what's going on now. I can be underwater anywhere on the planet and speaking to the planet via satellite and answer the questions of the people like I did in 1998 when I was in Fiji with people in Vietnam and in Canada asking me questions about what I was seeing underwater as they were looking at it. There's one human species that depend on nature, that depend on our ability to properly manage the resources and to look at it as you look at the capital where it's been made available to every one of us free of charge. And we need to make sure we manage it like you manage a business and only live off the interest that is produced by the capital. Today, as I've seen since my father pushed me overboard 78 years ago with a tank on my back, we're heading toward bankruptcy. We don't want to go there. Nobody wants to go there. And thanks to this institution, in a major way, we can avoid heading and continuing to head in that direction. There are people who are looking at it strictly from a business point of view, so be it. If you can feed people who could not afford 
the left over of those resources that we are still very painfully capturing in the ocean by being able to afford at a very low price what is going to provide you to have a life, a smile, a family, happiness. This is what it's all about. It's our choice. We have these amazing tools that you find in this place. Those people I had the privilege of meeting. Every time I come here, it recharges my batteries, and I go out there, and I tell the rest of the planet, yes, we can. Yes, we will. Yes, we are. And meeting those young people today, those students from different countries of the world, who are going to be the decision makers of tomorrow, it reminds me when my father used to tell me, Jean-Michel, people protect what they love. And I kept telling him, you know, Jeek, Dad, how can you protect what you don't understand? Now we do. Now we can protect what we love. Now we can protect what we depend upon, which is our ocean. And if you protect the ocean, you protect yourself, whether you live near the coastline or way, way inland. Because next time you drink a glass of water, you're drinking the ocean. Next time you're skiing, you're skiing on the ocean. It doesn't matter where you are on the planet. No water, no air, no life. And we know that thanks to our explorers in other parts of our solar system. We have a unique privilege on this planet. And thanks to the knowledge that is coming out of this institution, we have the ability to make sure that our species will be able to continue having the privilege that our parents, our grandparents, and we have today, and pass it on to the next generations. So I am a complete, firm, optimist believer that we're heading in that direction. Time is of the essence. And the slower we do it, the more difficult it is. But I see the acceleration taking place today, thanks to this particular institution, the people I've had the privilege of meeting. And this was not the first time, and I will continue, to help people help pass on the world and make it economically a success, because that's what is going to spread all over the planet today. I just want you to know that I owe a lot to this incredible gentleman who, because of his curiosity, his desire to see further and what we didn't know about, my dear father, we are where we are today when it comes to the ocean. But I also want to share with you where we're going next. And I'm excited, I'm like a kid in the starting block, because that's where we're going to go. I'd like to show you a little bit of history of where it came from. Before we were sailing the planet, but we didn't know what was under the surface. And thanks to Jacques-Yves Cousteau and his team, we started discovering in 1942 what was there. And today, we're in a position where we can make big difference. So if we can have the first DVD, please, I would appreciate. A lot of the material you're going to look at, I found in the attic of the house where I grew up. A lot of Before it has never Emperor, been shown publicly the well of Jacques Cousteau, in the past. The ocean was a realm reserved mostly for the military, science, weatherman, cargo ships, and those lucky enough to sail it for pleasure. In general, the world stood at the shore and gazed at the endless water and waves of the surface, dreaming of monsters 
island escapes or the lumbering equipment it took to get to sunken treasure. The insatiable curiosity and pioneering inventions of my father changed everything. From how we work in the sea to our fuller understanding of the sea's role in sustaining life as we know it to an environmental movement still struggling to be heard. The smiling Frenchman with his cameras first charmed us, then he warned us, and we've never been the same. Now we need a more active army of people who love the sea, understand that there was no life without water, and that we have to put all our efforts in saving whatever can be done for the future generations. This material was shot in 1938 and 42. Twice. First with his newly invented aqualung and underwater cameras, when he entered the sea and changed our perception of the very nature of our planet. And then again, as he continued to make sense of this new world and predicted the disaster of what we have done to it. What we are facing is the destruction of the ocean by pollution and by other causes. If nothing was done today, maybe 30, 40, 50 years will be the end of everything. Part of the greatness of my father's legacy is that the beauty of the sea is such a part of our understanding that we now take it for granted. But we ignored his predictions of where we were headed if we didn't change. He claimed we had no choice but to engage in the battle to protect the sea and a warming planet. He warned us 40 years ago. On the 100th anniversary of my father's birth, we explore the deeper adventure of how he changed the world and the lives of the people he touched and what his heirs to the legacy are trying to achieve. Is a privilege. For many years, through television, Jacques Cousteau was the most recognized person on the planet. In part, it's because the power to change people's minds, to alter forever their perception, is one of the hallmarks of greatness. Both celebrities and people unknown to the public continue to bear testimony to his influence in their lives. In the environmental message, that is in your latest production in mm. Avatar, mm -hmm. which has impacted a lot of people. Has been impacted by Cousteau or not? Absolutely. I think my first comprehension of the idea of the environment, of the concept of ecosystem, the concept of conservation, comes from those early films. I think I'm probably here doing what I'm doing right now, my life path because of what he brought to us, the world, in 1968 and in the years after that with his specials, with the undersea world of Jacques Cousteau. I loved his, uh, his message to the, the, the rights of the unborn, for the next generation's rights. Uh, that's become part of my credo that we, we owe it to coming generations that have not gotten here yet to leave them an inhabitable, beautiful world in as good a shape as we found it, or maybe better. He has inspired millions of people to think about, understand, and care for the oceans. So many of us took to the oceans to become scientists or scuba divers because of Captain Cousteau. Every kid wanted to be Jacques Cousteau, every kid wanted to be on Calypso. And uh, so I started snorkeling. And a few years later, I started diving. And then a year after that, I got my first camera because when you're on the ocean, you, you feel and you could see through Captain Cousteau's work that you, know, you, you just want to wrap your arm around the world and say, you got to see this, you got to see this, you got to appreciate it, you got to protect it, you got to value it. Jacques Cousteau awakened 
the world in the 50s and 60s and 70s, right on up to the last breath he took and the legacy he left with those who were inspired by all that he did. From spearing fish in the south of France to the aqualung, to something that's used all over the world, um, to doing motion pictures, to doing building submarines, one skinny Frenchman did all of this. And so that's kind of an inspiration to people like me saying, you know, if this guy could do all of this, surely I can find some, some way to do the things that I want to do. So I think uh, to everybody, he was a great inspiration. This event uh, was taking place not very far from here, by the way, on the Potomac. And it is very symbolic of the impact that this gentleman has had on decision makers, whatever their specialties were. So much so that uh, I've had the immense privilege of continuing his mission and trying to uh, keep up with what the objective was, which was to bring the ocean in everybody's home and for everyone to understand that we all connected to the ocean, whether we live there or far away from the ocean. And that led me, not very long ago, to put together a little piece which will tell us that not only we connected to the ocean, we depend upon it, the quality of our life, and by our mismanagement of the ocean, we are affecting our life support system. We're now knowing, we're now learning, we're now understanding. And because of knowledge, because of education, because of institution like this institution, we are today in a position to pass on the message to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of young people, hopefully millions of people, who are going to be the messengers in their own community. And I want to share with you our mission about one water cycle. Could we have the next DVD, please? One water cycle. Everything is connected. 70% of the planet is covered by the ocean. It starts at the top of the mountains when it snows and kids play and have fun. They're throwing pieces of ocean at each other. And ultimately that snow will melt as it goes into the streams, into the rivers, into the lake. Everything is connected. One water system. Unfortunately, already near the source, we find garbage. It rains and goes right back into the ocean. And along the way, we have these great children playing in water. And even there, as they're having fun, they encounter garbage. We are responsible. This can change. And whether it is going into those little streams, those big rivers, what we don't see coming from our big industries, our automobiles, our industries of all kinds, it runs off and goes right into the ocean.
not only with what we see, like plastics, but all these things we don't see, which are part of the water system, where it affects everything. When we have catastrophes, like what happened in the Gulf, we see the oil, we see the dispersant, which are affecting the marine life. And the dominant species, such as the beluga, naturally feed on the ocean floor. And then the dominant species that feed at the top of the food chain, the orcas, or the killer whales. They are the ones that are giving us all kinds of information. As these chemicals and heavy metals accumulate in the food chain, starting with the plankton, the foundations of all life, it goes all the way up to the big fish, the ones we catch, the ones we put in our plate. And the orcas are now, in certain parts of the world, having problems to reproduce, to have babies. It all starts at home. It all starts with our industries, with our decision makers, and those fish that we ultimately put in our plate, many of them, are affected by those chemicals such as the PBDEs, which are fire retardants, which we find in the air we breathe, in our computer, in our carpet, in children's clothes. It is unbelievable the effect that we have. So we decided to be tested here, a mother and her child, together with members of the government of California and, and ourselves at Ocean Futures. We went through 32 tests of chemicals and two of heavy metals. In this one case, the fire retardant, which is accumulated in the child of this young lady, is astronomical, shocking. This is what we're doing to ourselves. The water system is telling us we're now finding out, thanks to science, that 25% of the belugas that are found dead on the east coast of Canada have cancer. This is shocking and it can change because now we know they're dying. We find them dead on the beaches. How can we protect what we don't understand? In the middle of the Pacific, we found debris from 52 different countries I counted and all these little pieces are brought back by the birds that want to feed their babies with the eggs that are deposited on anything that floats in the middle of the ocean. Thousands and thousands of birds will never fly. Those baby birds will die with anywhere between 8 and 12 pieces of plastic in their stomach. This can change. Every one of us can help. These children in our program Ambassador of the Environment are the decision makers of tomorrow. They know, they learn, they will make better decisions. They can communicate with their parents. They can tell our decision makers that there's only one water system. Next time you drink a glass of water, you're drinking the ocean, which evaporates and is being pushed by the wind on the top of the mountain and makes the snow perfectly clean, which will melt down and go back into the ocean. Education, education, education is the answer. We need to get the children out of their schools with their teachers and bring them to wherever there is water, whether it's a lake, a river, or the ocean and make them feel, sense, touch, understand how connected we are to our life support system. We've been brainwashed, and for years and years and years, although we've ignored the fact that the biggest fish in the ocean happens to be a shark, because it has no teeth, the whale sharks. Hollywood hasn't found a way to spend $80 million to feature the biggest fish, the biggest shark that is going to gum you to death. <laughs> we are nuts. 
In the meantime, Jaws scared people away, so much so that many of my friends would not even take showers anymore. <laughs> we are nuts. We need to change. We need to understand how these creatures, maybe 440 species of sharks, which are playing like shrimps, crabs, lobsters, a critical role, which is to keep the ocean clean. Remove the dead ones, the sick ones, the deformed. They have a job to do. And here we are being scared about these amazing creatures. I was challenged one day, I was in South Africa, where there's a lot of great white sharks. And we wanted to film the great white sharks. We put ourselves in shark cages with our camera, filming them going by. And this gentleman who invited us to be there was telling me, he said, you know, I used to be a spare fisherman and I was making a living selling the fish I was catching. But one day I really, really got scared because one great white shark came and started biting my fish. He was doing his job. But he said, I was afraid that maybe he was going to bite me by accident, and I decided enough is enough. I'm going to now, since I have a beautiful fishing boat, put a shark cage on the side of my boat. I'm going to invite people to go in the shark cage, and they can take pictures of the great white shark, and I'm going to make a living. There's a lot of people doing that today, even in South Africa. And he said, you know, I can show you, Cousteau. You can be in a cage, but if there is nobody fishing, no blood in the water, and the water is clear, if there is a great white shark coming, I can swim with it. I can go there. I dive. And he went down there and he showed me. And he said, don't do this, don't do that, but you can do this. And I said, oh, great, wonderful, thank you very much. And he said, well, come on, Cousteau, don't be a wee-wee. <laughs> come out with me. Do what I've done. And I went, are you nuts or what? <laughs> well, after several days of being brainwashed, I said, OK. And I looked, made sure the water is clear. OK, nobody's fishing. There's no blood in the water. And I said, OK, I'm going to go. So I went and I did what he told me to do. And I want to show you that the nastiest fish in the ocean is not what we think or what we've made to believe. And I not, didn't do it just to be a macho diver. I did it to show the world that we need to understand nature, the fact that they have a role to play and that we are visitors and that if we respect them and do it when it's the right time to go, I'm back with all my fingers, and I was very honored to be able to share this moment. Probably other than this crazy gentleman, first person to share it with other people. Could we have the next DVD, please? As you can tell, I'm very, very concerned, looking left and right, and although huh, my guest, uh, my host is there, and the cameraman is there, but I, I come in last. And I'm hiding behind my host because this is a 14-foot female great white shark that just swam by. And as my host told me, at the right time, I said and did what he had taught me. Dive down, grab the upper back side of the dorsal fin. There are no nerve endings, and you can take a ride. And I was able to swim or to be towed away by these beautiful females. My feelings were hurt. A female, she never paid attention to me. Well, that has led me to understand more what's happening in that environment in that part of the world, in South Africa. It happens that there are a lot of penguins. And those beautiful penguins 
they live there. And when they go in the ocean fishing, well, there are great white sharks. And great white sharks in that part of the world love those penguins. It's like having an appetizer. I saw some of you tonight grabbing those little nuts. Well, let's get a penguin for lunch, uh, before lunch. And we were in the water at the right time when one of these amazing little penguins came by and a great white shark to -dum, to -dum, to -dum, was there. And we were able to film this incredible moment when the penguin came and so did a great white shark. Could we have the next DVD, please? African penguins live on the shores of Dyer Island off the southwestern coast of Africa and were once called jackass penguins because their vocalizations sound like a donkey's. One particular penguin entered the water in an area known to be home to a population of great white sharks. Great white sharks are known to devour penguins, so this little penguin better be on the lookout. But as we can see, the situation this time is completely under control of the penguin, not the shark. Because in nature, courage can come in small packages. There are other creatures which are critical as the foundation of life of the ocean, and many species depend upon those, particularly to feed themselves. And I'm thinking specifically about manta rays. Manta rays feed on plankton. They love plankton. And if we, as scuba divers, we go down at night with our flashlight, wow for whatever reason, it attracts the plankton, and manta rays loved to take advantage of that, not because of us or because of our lights, but because the plankton is in high concentration. So we were very privileged in Hawaii to film these amazing creatures. We are filter feeding on these important creatures, whether they are plants and animals, in the ocean. Could we have the next DVD, please? When they want to filter, they don't chew, they filter. They open their big mouth and they come and filter the plankton. Well, not very far further south of where we are, all the way down to Florida, whether it's east coast or west coast, there's a famous grouper called the Goliath grouper. I've known a lot of people who have made a living spearfishing Goliath groupers because they're very easy to approach, and some of them can be as big as 600 pounds, 800 pounds, and you can make a lot of money by bringing one of these fish back and selling it. I was very fascinated when I found out that the Goliath groupers as a species was threatened and may disappear. 
because they were too easy to catch. Scientists were invited to start to study the Goliath Coopers, and it became illegal to fish or spare fish Goliath Coopers. We were very honored with my children and our team to go to a place which I will never identify geographically, 200 miles away from Florida, where these groupers, which are individuals living, resident in different parts of the ocean, they don't move, they stay within their little territory and only come together when it's time to reproduce. About 200 miles, one of the location where we had the privilege of going with the scientists, we were able to go out there and see these Goliath Coopers. This was one of the most exciting experiences that I have had amongst many others. And I want to invite you to realize how critical it is, one, to understand, and two, to figure out what we need to do to protect those species which have been abused, overfished, and where they live, and the territory where they spend a lot of time before they go back into the open ocean, which happens to be the mangroves. These plants growing along the shoreline, which people don't like because they look ugly or they smell or whatever, they want to cut them off. Well, number one, you're removing what is protecting the coastline from wave actions, strong energy, hurricanes going from force three to force four, and on and on. But you're also eliminating all these plants which are where a lot of species reproduce and a lot of species go to be protected and hide, like the Goliath Coopers, which will travel 200 miles after they reproduce, after they give birth, to go and hide as little babies, the ones that have not been eaten by the other fish or other predators along the way, into the mangroves where they will sp spend between six and seven years before they venture back into the open ocean to find their new home. Absolutely fascinating. We need to understand, and again, thanks to science, all of that is making us realize not only we want to protect the Goliath Cooper's home, but we want to protect ourselves. It's all connected. And I want to take you on one of these amazing experiences that we had the privilege to be on. Could we have the next DVD, please? So we are on our way to that location, about 200 miles uh, south, a little bit uh, east from um, Florida, or the southern part of Florida. So we go down there, and it happens to be a shipwreck. And these Golai scoopers who are coming from many different parts of the ocean, to that specific location at a given time of the year, only once a year. Males and females are coming there, and while they are there, they're not feeding, and because they're not feeding, millions of little fish come because they feel protected by these big fish, because they're not going to be eaten, and by being there, they are protecting themselves from other predators. And, we're there watching them, waiting for this critical magic moment where they're going to release their eggs and sperm to fertilize the eggs. And we wait, and wait, and wait, and nothing is happening. Some of them can be as big as 800 pounds. I've never seen one, but I've seen five or 600 pounds. And here they are waiting for the right time. And the right time for them is a specific current 
a current that will happen in this particular time at night, where they're going to go away from that shipwreck altogether and release their eggs and fertilize them. Absolutely fascinating. We were very, very frustrated because, you know, we're a bunch of wires and we wanted to see them do it. And here they are waiting for the right time, the right current to go and release their eggs and fertilize them. With all these little fish hiding around these groupers. Absolutely fascinating. And ultimately, we were able to go to the Florida Keys and look at some of those small fish, the ones that had not been eaten along the way by predators. And of course, our team is ecstatic about this great experience that we have had in that part of the world. We've seen many in what's left of the mangroves. Some of these Goliath groupers about that size, about that size, about six to seven years when they start to go in the open ocean. My son, Fabien, who created Plant a Fish and we introduced oysters around Governor's Island in New York. We introduced turtles in Central America, has had hundreds and hundreds, and I was one of them, the uh, volunteers who planted mangroves in Florida along the coastline. And we have replanted, they've replanted probably two or three million of the mangroves. We need to protect ourselves. And to protect ourselves, we need to protect this environment which we all depend upon. But we know so very little. My father kept saying, you know, people protect what they love, and I kept saying, how can you protect what you don't understand? My frustration after 68 years of scuba diving has been, I cannot stay very long, and I cannot go deep. I am pretty much stuck within 100 meters, 300 feet, stuck and for a very short period of time. I always wanted to go deeper and stay longer, and today I'm so excited to tell you that together with 10 other people, I went to the process of being certified to be protected from the pressure, to be able to move like I'm moving right now and doing all these things to have a camera, to have lights, LEDs, to know where I am, to have propulsion system allowing me to go up, allowing me to go this way, and to go down. In 1,000 feet in five minutes, take, stay down there for 10 hours, explore, understand, discover, and come back in five minutes. I am now certified. I've gone through all the testing together with 10 other people. The equipment has been moved to Cape Cod out of Boston, where I was when I was 17-year-old cleaning diving equipment. And in March or April, I'm going to go down there. But it has taken me a long time, about two years, when I bugged this incredible gentleman in Canada, in Vancouver, Phil Newton, who has been building submersibles, 28 or 30 submarines that have been used scientifically in different parts of the world for scientific research, for understanding a little better of our planet, ocean. And He's built other pieces of equipment for the, uh, mostly the oil industry, but they're not what I was dreaming about. So a year and a half ago, he called me and he said, you know, I want to show you, I made a model, and that's where we're going to go. And I went to see it, and we filmed a little bit of it, and then I had to wait, and wait for a year and a half 
for the real piece of equipment to be made available to those people who are going to use it for commercial reasons to repair tunnel in which 30% or 35% of the fresh water that goes to the state of New York and Manhattan in particular is being lost. And they want to know why we're losing all that fresh water to help people. And that enterprise is going to go in those tunnels, sometimes 600 yards, a mile, whatever, to find out what's wrong so they can perhaps repair and stop wasting all that fresh water which we all depend upon. So I was with these incredible people and testing that equipment and passing the exam. Now I'm certified together with them and I'm waiting to do my ocean dive. It's great to be in a tank, but I want to be out there. Because that's going to allow scientists to discover things we haven't seen discover new parts of the ocean which we depend upon, new pharmaceutical product being created, new species that need to be protected or that can inspire us to perhaps, right here in this institution, reproduce them to feed the planet, to feed. Maybe in 20 years ago, eight or nine billion people. We're getting there. It's one of the most exciting times on our planet. But we need to get the world out there so decision makers, investors, business people, and governments make better decisions that they have made to make sure that this is happening. So the exosuit is one tool that is going to allow us to go where we want to go. Could we have the next DVD, please? Sound can go up a little bit. And here we are with some of the submersibles that he has built, some of the equipment for the, uh, mostly the oil industry. But that's the exosuit. That's where we're going to go. That's what we're going to use to go down to 1,000 feet in five minutes and spend 10 hours down there. So Phil is inviting me to see the model. This was a year and a half ago. So here is the beast, my friend. I'm all excited, of course. But it's only a model. It's not finished. It's not usable yet. And I look at it. Camera. LED lights. OK. OK. To be able to do echo sounding. Okay, propulsion system, hands. They are now going to be hands which will repeat what your fingers are doing, like you see Phil now. So he can pick up things, samples, open a bottle, whatever. Propulsion system, horizontal and vertical. You command it with your right foot and left foot. Everything is articulated. Of course, this is very heavy because you're above water. So what water. do you think? It's good suit. Well, so I'm all excited. I, it's fascinating. And obviously, when am I going to get in? Well, I'll tell you what. If you want to climb inside here, we can certainly arrange that. Come around the front and we'll get the suit open and get you in there. OK. Well, I waited a year and a half for that to happen. And oh, here we so are. Here it is. We're gonna <laughs> the big moment, huh? Oh yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> You're looking pretty good. So we've got all the weight and balance pretty much set up, and uh, it should be fine for you. Well, it looks like it's gonna be a, a lot easier than last time. Oh yeah. So we made a number of changes, as you know, and uh, it should be working fine now. We've been been uh, testing, you know, for the last three four days, and everything. You'll be really, I think you'll be impressed by how smooth you know, the thrusters are and everything. So. 
you go. This is great. So if you want to climb on up there and right. start getting Can in. Can I get in? Okay. Yeah. Yep. You can get in. Um, just step one foot into the front here. Yeah. Training Come takes on, three days. Just underneath you can see the black here. housing on the, on, yeah, right there. Yeah. That's right up there. One foot in. Stand in the middle step and the then clutch. just kind of sit on the back. You oh, slide your legs feet up <laughs> into <laughs> the <laughs> other legs. Okay. Okay, Come down out. and you are sitting okay. because Double your right foot set yourself will uh, point point to propel towards. you forward, yeah. backwards, yeah. left and right. Forward and your left down. foot will propel you wiggle. up or wiggle, down. Wiggle. Ah, got it. And you're sitting, you're very comfortable. Okay. okay. And, and then you have to shut down, down the thing, but you can put your hands into the arms the move up and down. or you can remove them yeah. at will. So you can diving. control I mean cameras, you can check your uh, air, uh, right, right which has been recycled and arrow. has to be yeah. a certain quality. Right. So so toe down on your, on your right down. foot is forward. Forward, heel down, heel down is reverse. Back. Yeah. And other side. Other side is your We're repeating down. this because toe of the, uh, the show. Heel down, come up. For people to understand. That's done. Okay, my friend, so this is it. Next uh, thing you know, you're going to be in the air and I hope you don't get air sick and then into the water and okay. start to um, rock just, and roll. Yeah, just a second. Been a long time waiting for this. Yes. Looking forward to it. Thank you. Okay, my friend, take care. I'll see you in the tank. Yes. Oh. I never believed as they were closing the exosuit and putting the face mask on. That uh, suddenly I was going to think that I was an astronaut. As they had to lift the exosuit up to put it in the tank. So, goodbye, here I am going into space. And you can see a little bit of Vancouver in the back. One of the most exciting time of my life. As they're going to put me into tank, unfortunately, the cameraman was uh, not able to uh, film everything I wish he had been filmed. But regardless, uh, here we are being dumped in the water. And there are a bunch of people down below watching everything. We're still connected, although in the wild we'll be unconnected, disconnected, completely disconnected, on your own, which is my dream, obviously. And here we are being put into the water to make sure everything's fine. And that's where you use your arms, you use your propulsion system, you use your legs, you show that you are comfortable and you can manipulate this incredible piece of equipment which is allowed, going to allow us to discover a layer between 100 meters and 300 meters, which we know very little, if anything, about. How can we protect what we don't understand? We're gonna be able to, at least within that depth. So we were taken back and uh, I immediately thought about my dad and I wanted to thank him for all the help that he has provided us to start discovering this incredible place, Planet Ocean. And as I landed, I had ultimately to put the red hat on to thank him for doing this, for 
making me one of his team members, together with some wonderful people whom I always considered a part of my family. So what do you think of that? Well, so I'm you. getting off, this and is, this, is, this is stepping. Phil is there. In, uh, my dream again, ah. and I look forward to the next time. I want to thank all these guys for You're all your welcome. help. This yeah. has been Good amazing. Day. I thank you. And uh, okay, and what we have to for me, you? this is you know, oh, yes, this of is uh, a step. Jacques Cousteau brought us to a uh, hundred meters, three hundred feet, and. We're now going to go to 300 meters, and it's going to allow us to uh, discover a huge amount of the ocean where we know nothing. So thank, thank you, you my friend. Always a pleasure. Yeah. Thank you very oh. much. Thank you. Yay. I would like to close my uh, presentation tonight, and I hope this was meaningful for all of you who have taken the time to come out here. and to understand and to be in a position to support this incredible facility, this incredible institution. I can tell you one thing, I'll be, and I will continue to be, one of your best supporters. We need to get the world out there. We need decisions to be made. I've been involved with NOAA and with the National Marine Sanctuary System for many, many years. I was able to sit down with the President of the United States, President Bush, W. Bush, and convince him that he needed to protect the Northwestern Hawaiian Island after we went there and we saw what we saw. I showed him the two-hour special that we had produced for PBS. He was so touched that he declared the Northwestern Hawaiian Island a national marine monument. As a result, the largest protected piece of ocean at the time, bigger than the Great Barrier Reef in Australia. Since then, a lot has happened, whether the British have done some of it in the Indian Ocean or the United States has done more where I was recently three weeks ago in American Samoa where a lot of that protected area has been expanded to become the largest one in the U.S. Where I visited a beautiful little island called Twains, which I want to make sure is protected as one of the last jewels of the planet. And have people on the island and underwater communicate with all of us on the planet and answer questions of people who want to see one of the few jewels we have left on the planet, whether it's underwater or above water. Thanks to the National Marine Sanctuary System, we've been able to produce not only two hours of television, but also a book. And then more recently, because I realized we need to connect with all the schools in this country, people kept answering my questions in a way which was shocking when I asked them, how many marine sanctuaries are there in the United States? Most people don't know. I was a little south of here on one of those sanctuaries. We were off loading our truck to go and film. And our diving equipment was being pulled out and so on. And a gentleman walked by and said, what are you doing? We said, sir, we are doing a film on marine sanctuaries of the United States. And he looked at us and he said, oh, I didn't know the Marines had a sanctuary. <laughs> we have a long way to go when it comes to education. A long way to go. We need to bring all of this, and it's your tax dollars, by the way. This is good news into all the school systems of this nation and abroad as well to show what has been done, which is good. As a result of that, I went to a publisher down in Florida, Ocean Publishing, happens to be Ocean Publishing, and I said, sir, I want you to publish books about the National Marine Sanctuary System, but they have to be under $20. 
So sponsors, people, individuals can take these books and put them in the school system so young people, the decision makers of tomorrow, will learn about what is there that has been created for the protection of our ocean, for us to understand, to learn from. And he went ahead and he published a book for the Southeast, he published a book for the West Coast, and he just published a book for the Northeast of the United States, which is Thunder Bay, Stellwagen Bank, and the Monitor. This needs to be in every school. And so young people and their teachers can learn about those treasures that have been put aside for them. The next book will come at the beginning of next year. It will be about the other marine sanctuaries in the middle of the ocean, whether it's the Northwestern Hawaiian Island or American Samoa or Maui, where the humpback whales are being protected. Those incredible creatures which are coming from Alaska all the way down to Hawaii and Maui in particular, where I had the privilege of going with my colleagues under a scientific permit and span with we breathers not making bubbles because whales and dolphins are very sensitive to sounds underwater. And I found out many other creatures, by the way, but we don't have time to go there. But those whales can be disturbed by sounds, because sounds travel great distances. Let's not forget that they don't see very well underwater. Thus, their primary sense is acoustic sound. They communicate with sounds. They can communicate hundreds of miles away with each other. And we have 65,000 ships at sea, 24-7, on the planet ocean emitting all kinds of sounds, some of them which are extremely disturbing to these creatures. So what I'd like to do is to share with you this amazing two hours and 20 minutes, which I've condensed into three minutes and eight seconds, of being with these amazing creatures, the humpback whales in Maui, and for you to think about what you haven't done yet that you can do to help get the information out, share the information with people who can make a difference, whether they're in business, in government, or your neighbors, or your friends, or your family. We can all make a difference every day. And I keep asking myself that every day when I wake up. And I said, I'm awake. I'm getting another bonus. Every day is a bonus when you reach a certain age. And I'm so glad. And I want to thank Dr. Zohar because it's all his fault if I'm here. And then it became the whole institution that has invi invited me to be here tonight. What it is that every one of us can do as I share with you this magic moment that I spend with these whales that allowed us, not emitting any sound because we were on rebreathers, no bubbles, to be able to be closer to them than I am to you, to be as close as I was with this drape here. And not touching, I respect it. And their eyes being right there looking at me like I was looking at them. We have so much to learn and so much to take advantage of for the quality of our lives that we need to make sure we protect it, we manage it, and we are in a position, again, this institution of being, and I will say, and I really mean it, the leading institution to solve some of the problems, critical problems, to feed ourselves, feed the starving people in other parts of the world, to get energy, renewable energy, easy, cheap energy in a way, and to solve some of the medical problems that we have by coming up with answers coming from the ocean in some of the medical products that we need to use 
for ourselves. So I hope these three minutes and eight seconds will inspire you to do something for every one of us on the planet. And I want to, again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for inviting me to share my passion with all of you tonight. Could we have the next DVD, please? Thank you very much, Jean-Michel. That was a fantastic experience for all of us. And Jean-Michel has kindly agreed to take a few questions from members of the audience. We do have two microphones set up in the center aisle. I ask you to go to one of those microphones and please give your name and uh, keep your questions short. So. Go ahead, if you start uh, moving to those microphones, Jean-Michel, if you can join me again. And as you are plucking up the courage to ask your questions, I'm going to start with one. You, you know, people don't ask questions because they've learned enough. They don't. <laughs> anyway, you have a question. Oh, they're very shy. I'll keep it short as well. We know how much work you do traveling around and educating people and inspiring us all about the marine environment. We heard about your adventures in March and April with the exosuit. 
When will you next go scuba diving, and where are you going in the next uh, few weeks? Uh, tomorrow afternoon, I'm leaving for Brazil, where we're going to uh, launch two things. One, a photo exhibition, which is moving from uh, Rio to Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo to Manaus in the middle of the Amazon, where I was with my dad and our team in 1981-82, and where we went back there in 19. Uh, in 2006 and 7, and uh, the population uh, of Manaus was 400,000 people in 81. Uh, when I was there in uh, 2007, it was 1.3 million people, and today I spoke to uh, people in Manaus, it's 2 million people. Uh, 20 million people have moved into the Amazon, they don't know what they're getting into, they're cutting trees, they're building a house, and six months later, the house is underwater because the level of the water goes up to, up to 23 meters. And uh, they don't know anything about malaria. They're catching malaria. They're having all kinds of problems. We want to educate them. So the government of the state of Amazonas has signed a document endorsing our program called Sustainable Rainforest. And we want that to be distributed all over uh, the Amazon. It's very, very complicated. There's no roads, no airports. The territory is as big as continental United States, so it's all done by the river systems, and we need a uh, huge amount of support. There's a gentleman who knew my dad, who is giving us two floors on the building where we can have uh, the employees, and uh, they can sleep there, they can be fed, because there's a restaurant, an hotel, uh, nearby, but we need to find the, uh, the, a way to, one, pay them salaries, and also the logistics of taking all that material into all these rivers all over the, the 10 years of work to be done. And so I'm going to be in Manaus, where we're going to launch a book that is about, called Return to the Amazon, about all the history that we lived uh, in, in the past, recent past, and uh, that book is being printed on plastic paper recycled. And uh, that's going to be launched in Portuguese, of course, and then ultimately will be in Spanish, in French, and many other languages. Uh, that's what I'm doing, uh, leaving tomorrow. I'll be in Sao Paulo, in uh, Manaus, and in, uh, uh, in Rio, uh, where I had the privilege of being there uh, for Rio Plus 20. And uh, we ask in those days, a lot of us, uh, for 20% of the open ocean to be protected. That concept is still being pushed forward. And then from that, I am rushing back to California because I have to change my underwear. Uh, and then I'll be on my way to Fiji, where there, there is a team who is, uh, we're the first people to film uh, everything in IMAX 3D on sharks, dolphins, whales, uh, turtles, and so on. And uh, I recommended, and they agreed with me, that now they need to feature the presence of human being into their shows so the, the, the viewers can be attached, can, be, can recognize themselves, just like my dad did a long time ago. But uh, uh, I wanted them to focus on the secrets of the ocean, the birth of coral reefs, the uh, plankton drifting in the middle of the ocean, uh, some amazing creatures that like, uh, there is a worm which is called the bololo worms that releases its uh, eggs and sperm by disconnecting part of their body and it goes up to the surface. And it happens that people, and in this case Fiji, the people are catching them, they eat them or they cook them and so on, an amazing thing. And I want people to understand the foundation of all life into the ocean, how everything goes from there on up. And that show will be, uh, it's going to take us about 10 months to uh, film, uh, film it. Uh, the production, the uh, post-production will be done at the end of next year. And it will be aired on uh, theaters uh, in different parts of the world, in different languages, uh, starting in February 2015. There's this beautiful space here, which could be turned into a beautiful IMAX theater. <laughs> <laughs>
projection system. Maybe uh, we should talk more about that. Yeah, yes. absolutely. I mean, it could be done in no time. And then from there, uh, I'm going on a cruise ship where I'm going to blah, 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 and the stern of the cruise ship opens up, and it, between all my blah, blah, blahs, I can go diving, diving, Fantastic. and seeing what's there. And I'll be back on the 15th of, of November. Good. We have one question. I can't hear you and I can't see you. We were at Heron Island. Heron Island, yes. They needed to be more, uh, thank you. So, so you made a brave statement 19 years ago at Heron Island telling the divers they needed to dive more responsibly. And, and 35 years ago, your father told fishermen they needed to fish more responsibly. You came here and told us all this great stuff we're doing. What do you have to tell us? What do I have to tell? Well, my, hello. Hello. Oh, here we go. My best advice is very simple. This institution, in the different part of the university and so on, is doing some, some amazing things. And I have to say, nobody knows about it. I mean, it's not an issue of being local. It's an issue of being international. We need to spread the world. That would be my mission number one to get the world out there, there are solutions, and we can do it. And if I am uh, an investor, I want to build a hundred of those fish farms to feed people and make money. That's what I would do. But I'm not, you know, I beg for every dollar. So, uh, that, but that's what I would do. And if I was in education, I would, I would bring that information to everybody on the planet. Yes, we are doing it, we can do it, and we will do it. That's really the best recommendation that I can make. Get some sponsorship of people whose specialty is to communicate with the media, communicate with the world, communicate with the industries, and with the government. The solutions are coming out of here. Let's do it. Thank you. Next question. Good evening. Uh, my name is Les Burke. I am a uh, retired Navy diving officer. I'm also the current uh, diving safety officer for the University of Maryland College Park. I had the uh, honor and the opportunity to meet your father in May of uh, 1985. And I want to finish something that you started a couple of times and, and he actually said, and I, it really struck home with me, we protect what we love, we love what we know, we know what we understand, and we understand what we are taught. I run a program called Junior Scientists in the Sea, where we have several of the students here from the inner city of uh, Baltimore here today. That meeting, that chance meeting, because it was one-on-one -on -one, um, between myself and the captain, was very moving and it changed my life. So what I'd like to know from you, and looking at the crowd, I mean no, no disrespect, but all of the reserve seats up there, I think there are three children. How accessible are you going to be, or will you be, um, to the children so that we can carry on this message, so that we can use your star power to, to um, enlighten them about the oceans and the watersheds and the estuaries. Very nice. Uh, I had the privilege of meeting, uh, I forgot if it was 11 or 13 uh, students today who are in the business in this institution and have different uh, specialties, different parts of the United States and, and at least four or five other countries uh, who are going to be, uh, of course, very important people to share the information in their business. At Ocean Future Society, we have a program which is called Ambassador of the Environment, which is being distributed in different parts of the planet. We have some on uh, hotels like the Ritz-Carlton. There's three in the uh, 
the Caribbean. There's one in Hawaii. There's uh, two uh, in the making right now in other parts of the world. We have a program in Greece and France. We have a program in uh, French Polynesia on the Paul Gauguin, the cruise ship, for 14 weeks during the summer, our summer, their winter, but our summer because the parents go there with their children. And you know, you put a child on a ship after three or four hours, they've been everywhere, including where they're not supposed to go. And uh, we want to make sure they have uh, the advantage of learning about where we are, and, and South Pacific is a fabulous place to do that. We have programs in California. We have a program which goes from March to uh, Thanksgiving on Catalina Island. We even have a program which is called Family Camp, where the parents can come with their children, grandchildren, nephew, whatever, uh, during the summer. And uh, we're trying to expand these educational programs everywhere we can. And then we have, thanks to sponsorship, a program called Sustainable Reef, uh, which is being distributed by sponsors in uh, the, British, uh, the British Virgin Islands, in English, in French Polynesia, in French, in American Samoa, in Samoan. Uh, and of course, we're looking for other uh, sponsorship for many different countries who are in great need of understanding uh, through their school systems the importance of the coral reefs that uh, live uh, or that are around their islands and countries. So uh, I wish, you know, uh, we need, uh, we need uh, not just support, but we need more people, and there are a lot of people here who can go and share the information in, in the school systems or get the kids out of school and get them sense, feel, and touch. Just like I was saying earlier when I went to Kalamazoo and met 2,600 children who 40% uh, of them had never seen the ocean. And I had the privilege of spending three days with them and answering their questions and taking them to the river and telling them, you, know, you see that plastic bottle? Do you know where it's gonna go? In the ocean and on and on and on. And then we explained to them how connected we are to the ocean. So education is critical, getting the message out there, sitting down with decision makers, which I do all the time, whether it's in government or industries, uh, is critical. I just sat down with the president of France twice because when he did his campaign, he was talking about protecting the ocean. What has he done? Nothing. Okay. Maybe it was not your priority, although you spoke about it a lot. Uh, can I help you? And uh, I'm going to have another meeting with him uh, very soon. And I do that with different uh, decision makers. Uh, but we need more people to do that. Never, never criticize, never point a finger. When you point a finger, there's three fingers pointing at you. Forget about that. We need dialogue, reaching the heart. Everybody has one. The few people will. Not much up there. Uh, but the heart, they all have one. Okay, we'll take two more quick questions before we break. Uh, next question, please. Hi, my name is Nicole Beltry Gooden. I'm a Baltimore City Public School teacher. I teach across the harbor at Digital Harbor High School. Um, I'm also the chair for Baltimore Inner City Outings. And for my students, three who are here this evening got certified um, as scuba divers this past summer with um, junior scientists in the sea. Um, I now have some scuba addicts, um, and scuba is a pretty pricey endeavor. Um, I'd love to know where I can get funding for a class set of your book um, so that I can introduce it into my AP Biology class at minimum and potentially have a marine biology course um, at my high school. Well, thank you very much, and uh, I have a lot of respect for teachers. Uh, they need to be uh, recognized as probably in a, some of the very most important people on the planet. Unfortunately, this is not the case all, all the time. Uh, you have this company, which I have the privilege of uh, heading, with a wonderful team. You can become a member of Ocean Future Society. It's free. And the reason why it's free is because I didn't want any children to ask their parents for $25. And as a result of that, our membership is completely private. 
legally, we're not allowed to sell it, exchange it, or give it away. And as a member, you can ask us all the questions. You can go on our website. You can learn about what we do and understand about all the educational material that is available to share with any institution, any schools, anywhere on the planet. Thank you. Next and last question, please. Hi, my name is Kate McManus, and I work at University of Maryland, Baltimore. And my question is, why do you think that NASA has been so well funded? Sorry, can you repeat that and stand really close to the mic? We didn't quite catch that. Sorry, I'm probably talking too quickly. Um, my question is, why do you think that NASA has been so well funded and exploration of the ocean hasn't been as well funded? Why NASA has been well funded and not for the ocean? Well, uh, first of all, NASA is in trouble right now, but that's another issue. Uh, <laughs> We, as a land species, you know, I, I've, when I was a, a teenager, I wanted to live underwater. And I realized when you're in the water for too long, you stop to have wrinkles all over. So uh, we're not made to be underwater. We are temporary visitors. It is a foreign environment. It is a scary environment. We made it, Hollywood particularly, made it a very, very scary environment. We always used to look at the child, whether it's six or well, eight months or older, we're always looking up. We never look at the ocean, we're always looking up. We have this tendency to want to discover or go or feel what's out there. Let's not forget that every astronaut, in order to experience being weightless, is a scuba diver first. There is not one single astronaut, whether U.S. or foreigner, that have not been scuba diving first. And we have this tendency of wanting to know what, what is the solar system we live in. And we spend a lot of energy and resources to go and find out what's happening on the moon, what's happening in Venus, what's happening elsewhere. We want to go there. I want to go there. But you know what? We're not going to continue going there unless we take care of home base. And home base is what makes us being able to do all of the dreams that we have to go and explore other parts of our solar system. We will if we take care of home base. And that starts by taking care of our ocean. If you protect the ocean, you protect yourself, and that's our mission. Thank you.